ID the Future, a podcast about evolution and intelligent design. Can biology inspire human technology? I'm Casey Luskin with ID the Future, and today we have on the show with us Dr. Brian Miller, who is research coordinator at Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture. He holds a bachelor's degree in physics with a minor in engineering from MIT and a PhD in physics from Duke University. He's a very widely traveled speaker on the topic of intelligent design, and he helps to manage our ID 3.0 research program here at Discovery, in particular, our engineering research group. So Brian, it's great to have you on the show with us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So the occasion for our conversation is a story that recently came out in Science Daily about an article that was published in the Journal of the Royal Society Interface. And this is about how engineers are trying to mimic the feathers on an African bird to find a better way to hold water. So this article detailed the ability of this amazing bird called the Namakwa sand grouse that lives in Namibia of Southern Africa to use its feathers to hold water so it can carry water back to its young. So could you please provide some background about what this research was all about? Uh, sure. It was research conducted out of John Hopkins University in com- a partnership with MIT. And the main researchers were Jochen Mueller from Hopkins and then Lorna Gibson from MIT. They were part of engineering departments. And what they did is they looked at this particular bird, which had an amazing ability because it lives in African deserts and it typically will nest about 20 miles from watering holes. So what it does is it'll actually fly to the watering holes and it'll go in the water and its feathers on its belly have very unusual properties. They're very different from other feathers. And they form almost a cup-like structure that allows it to carry the water back to the nests. And that's really quite a feat because it's carrying about 15% of the bird's body weight and it's flying about 40 miles per hour for about a half an hour. These researchers looked at the mechanics and the chemical properties of these feathers. And they understood the extraordinary ability of what it did and why it did it. And they want to mimic that for human products. So this is, of course, a process known as biomimicry or biomimetics, where engineers will try to mimic biology in order to improve human technology. So in this case, what did the researchers discover about the feathers that allowed them to carry so much water? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to read one section right from their paper because they say it as well as it can possibly said. So I'm going to quote from directly. It says, along most of the length of the feather, there are two distinct zones. In the inner zone, in the dry state, the barbules coil helically at their base. And I need to define some of these terms before I go on, because in a feather, what you have is a central vein. That's what we're used to when we see a feather. Barbs are sort of the the side filaments that come off the vein, and then even smaller filaments come off the barbs, which are called barbules. So that's what they're referring to. So the barbules coil helically at their base, uh, adjacent to the barb shaft, and then straightening out. The intertwining of the adjacent helical coils provides cohesion to the inner zone of the vein. In the outer zone, the barbules are straight and much longer, forming fringes. In both the inner and outer zone, the barbules lack the usual hooklets and grooves seen in contour feathers and other species of birds. On wetting, the helical coils of barbules in the inner zone unwind, rotating the barbules perpendicularly to the plane of the vein, producing a dense forest of fibers that hold water through capillary action. At the same time, the longer barbules of the outer zone curl in towards the feather shaft, aiding in water retention. On drying, these structural changes in both the inner and outer zone are reversible. In other words, what happens is when these feathers get wet, they reconfigure themselves in very specific ways to create this net that can carry the water. It's really quite remarkable. Yeah, and we'll try to post a link to the paper. It's actually an open access paper in the Journal of Royal Society Interface. And if you look at figure one, you can actually see how these birds use this reconfiguration of their feathers to carry water. It's kind of like these little cups that form on the bottom of their belly. And as they're flying along, there's water that's sort of trapped between the feathers and their body. And it's it's really quite amazing. So Dr. Miller, do you think that engineers could copy this design for a similar purpose to carry water? Yes. In fact, the authors of the paper presented several ideas of how they could mimic this design in human products. One is obviously netting for collecting and retaining water from fog and dew in desert regions. 
And that makes a lot of sense since these birds live in the desert. So you create a netting that is just as efficient, or at least is, is almost as efficient at, at collecting water. And that could be used to have a, a larger water resource in these African countries or other desert countries. Um, they also talked about creating water bottles that have this, this mesh that's designed to prevent sort of the, the annoying swigging and sloshing of water. So if you're a jogger, the water kind of splashes around. So this netting could trap it, which would create a more even flow. Also, they're talking about next level medical swabs that could more efficiently soak up liquid and more easily release them. So these are just a few of the applications they're thinking of borrowing from nature. So, Brian, just as an aside, do you find it a little bit suspicious that engineers are able to use biology to improve human technology? Or is this just an anomaly? Is this a very rare case where they're actually finding something useful in biology that could be used in human technology? Or are there many examples where biologists have identified, you know, sort of extraordinary design in life that they have copied to Im improve our technology? Oh, oh, actually, this is extremely common. That's why there's a whole field of biomimicry. And there's many iconic examples. And so engineers are very carefully studying life to try to steal nature secrets. Um, one of the classic examples is a spider's web, because the spider, using chemistry inside of its body at room temperature, can produce these fibers that have 10 times the strength of steel, and they're tougher than Kevlar, and they are non-toxic, and they are biodegradable. So these are incredible examples of material science. So another example would be the efficiency and accuracy of bat and dolphin sonar. They're amazing abilities we're trying to learn from. Um, you could talk about molecular machines. So for instance, things like ATP synthase and, and the bacterial motor, the flagellum, which acts like an upward motor, they operate with efficiencies that are close to 100%. It's like the upper 90 some percent. So people are regularly wanting to copy these molecular machines for our own nanotechnology. And of course, people are looking at things like DNA replication, translation, processes in embryology, sensory processes, because they actually operate at efficiencies that are close to the limits of what is physically possible. And one practical application is people are trying to see if we could also store information in chemical molecules like DNA, which would greatly increase the capacities of our computers. Those are just a few of the examples. So that's really quite extraordinary, Brian. And I want to ask you, I mean, what does this tell you about nature? Does this point to design in nature if it's actually doing technological functions that we need better than our own technology? Oh, yeah, this absolutely is screaming out design in a very clear way. And it's very profound because if you look at the way scientists, biologists in particular, look at life, if they assume that life is not designed, it was just produced by some blind, undirected process, then their intuitions have consistently led them in the wrong direction. They've consistently assumed that life should be poorly designed, suboptimal, we could do it better, inefficient. And what's happened is as people have looked at the designs more carefully, and particularly as engineers have become part of that conversation, they're realizing that life shows extraordinary design that often uses the same design logic that we use, except it does it many times more efficiently and with much greater genius. That is really extraordinary. So here's sort of an objection. Sometimes we're told that there is actually poor design in living systems and that we don't want to copy it, that actually if it was intelligently designed, it would look different and we can use our intelligence to improve on what we see in biology. How accurate are these sorts of claims? Yeah, and I often will call that the sort of imperfection of the gaps type, type argument or the materialism of the gaps type argument. And this is a mistake that's made over and over in many, many ways. Because what happens is biologists, when they will look at some biological system, if they don't immediately understand why some feature is the way it is, they'll assume it's poor design because it's not the way they would do it. Now, there's several problems with that. And the main problem is that the people making these assessments are not engineers, so they don't really know what good engineering looks like. When engineers come to the table, or when just biologists that have a little bit better understanding of the biology come to the table, they consistently realize that what was originally assumed to be poor design is later recognized to be very, very good design. And there's several examples of that. Like one of the classics is the backwards wiring of the eye. The people would look at the fact that if you look inside of a vertebrate eye, like humans, the photoreceptors do not face forward. 
but they face backwards. Biologists said at first that this looks like a really bad design, that the only reason it, it faces backwards is because of the constraints of the evolutionary process. It's just kind of an accident of, of history. Well, what's happened is our understanding of eyes have improved. We realize that that is completely false. The photoreceptors have to face backwards or they wouldn't work. What happens is you have in photoreceptors these discs, which is where the photoreception takes place, and they're constantly burning out. So if the photoreceptors face forward, they would burn out pretty quickly. But they face backwards, embed themselves in other tissue, and there's very special and complex mechanisms in that interaction that essentially remove the burnt out discs to allow room for new discs to be created. In addition, the attachment to these tissues is essential because it allows the replenishment of nutrients and the recharge of different molecules. So the fact that the photoreceptors face backwards is not a poor design, it's essential. And there's lots of other ingenious mechanisms in eyes to allow light to reach the photoreceptors most efficiently. Like for instance, you have specialized cells that will help the light directly access photoreceptors, almost like waveguides or photooptic cables. Even in photoreceptors, the mitochondria have a lensing effect, which again, bring the light directly to the photoreceptor areas that detect the light. So again, this is just one of countless examples of where biologists originally assumed something looked like there was poor design, but on closer inspection, they realized it was optimally designed. Other examples are like the laryngeal nerve, the ACL joint and knees, the appendix, and the list could go on very for a very long time. Yeah, this really is an interesting situation, I think, where evolutionary mechanisms lead you to one sort of expectation about living systems, that they will be sort of poorly cobbled together kludges that are not actually going to function in a very efficient manner, whereas intelligent design says, well, yeah, things can decay from their original design, things can break, sometimes in our imperfect world, things aren't assembled properly, but generally, things have a good design that's actually going to work well. And it's, I think this is a very fascinating field that you're interested in here, Brian, to help us to discriminate actually between what are we finding? Is it what we would expect from evolution or is it what we would expect from design? You're absolutely right. So you are actually part of one of our ID 3.0 research projects, Dr. Miller, called the Engineering Research Group, which is studying how engineering principles can help us bring a better understanding to living systems. Essentially, if we assume that living systems are designed, then we can make more progress in understanding how they work through sort of an engineering lens. So how is their approach different from what biologists have traditionally done to understand how life works? That's an excellent question. And I need to preface it by saying that we are operating in a way that more and more biologists are seeing biology because the evidence has forced biologists to change their assumptions and their approach to studying biology. Because historically, biologists have been very reductionistic. They would apply a principle called reductionism, where they assume the way you understand life is you break it into its smaller pieces, all the way down to single cells and eventually down to simple chemical, simple chemical reactions. And then as you understand the lowest level processes, everything else is sort of emergent properties of these lower level processes. So a complex system is essentially no more than the sum of its parts. It's simply the different parts doing what they're doing in a more unified way. They also assumed, as, as we mentioned, that they assumed suboptimality, that, it, that things are generally poor designed. They assumed that things really don't look like human engineering because human engineering is really the sort of top-down design where a mind plans everything in advance and puts everything together for a purpose. While biologists typically assume that life would represent what's called a Rube Goldberg design. And that's like those famous cartoons where you have some crazy inventor that uses like a parrot and a toaster oven and a TV and all sorts of objects that aren't designed to work together to perform some simple task like wiping their chin with a napkin. That's a Rube Goldberg machine. But what's happened is the evidence has forced biologists to again, again, exchange these sort of materialistic evolutionary assumptions with design-based assumptions. So now biologists are, are looking at biology at a systems level. The term they're using is holism. In fact, they're even describing in mainstream circles this revolution that's taking place. They're now assuming that things are optimally designed. They're assuming that you can apply the same engineering principles or you can look for the same engineering principles that we use 
in life. And this is a burgeoning field uh, within what's also often called systems biology. So what's happening in the engineering research group is we're just walking in pace with this revolution taking place. So we have systems engineers and other engineers that are asking the question, what is the higher level design of these systems? Like whether it be hearing or a bacterial motor or something like the immunity system. And how can we see the same engineering principles that we use in human engineering? How can we map those onto life to give us better understanding? So for instance, in, in systems engineering, we know that different systems can only work together if they have carefully designed interfaces, if they have communication protocols that use the same dictionary and the same protocols. We, we know that you have to have a meticulously organized assembly processes, operational processes, maintenance processes. You have to have risk management. Uh, you have to have adaptive responses with feedback control. So we have several projects where our engineers and biologists are working together to look for these same mechanisms in life. And we're actually in the process of publishing several papers along those lines. Can you give some specific examples of how an engineering framework bring, brings us to a better understanding of living systems? Oh, yes. A very good question. Um, let me just start off by mentioning Stuart Burgess, because he is considered one of the top engineers in the United Kingdom. What he has done is he has looked at living systems for inspiration to improve human design mechanical systems. A great example is he has several research papers that look at the human knee and show how the principles used in the human knee can be used to design better prosthetic limbs. And then a research article that actually came out not too long ago in the journal Biocomplexity, he studied the ankle foot complex and showed that it was actually a master of engineering. And what inspired him partly to do this article was a book by Nathan Lentz, who's a biologist. And in that book, he argued that that human body is filled a very, very poor design. And he talked about this ankle foot complex in very disparaging terms. He said, there's just too many bones. It's inefficient. It, it breaks all the time. And what Stuart Burgess did is he applied a systems engineering perspective to this ankle bone complex. And he started from the top down design. He asked the question, what does this thing need to do? What are its, what are its goals? And he mentioned several goals like flexibility, strength. He talked about walking, running, jumping. Um, he talked about joint movement from inward to outward and balance. And what he showed is based on all these subfunctions, every aspect of the ankle is optimally designed to achieve multiple goals. And that's a major difference between how engineers see biology and how someone like Nathan Lentz does. Because Nathan Lentz, what he did is he looked at one feature, one goal of the foot and said, you know, all these bones in the foot don't achieve this one goal very effectively. What he failed to realize is engineers are to have uh, always look at multiple competing constraints. There's always multiple things a design object needs to do. So you have to balance different features for an optimum performance for all of these different goals. So Stuart Burgess did a wonderful job of showing how the ankle was optimally designed and why it was so efficient at all these different goals. That's just one example. Another great example is Waldine Schultz, who wrote um, a three-part series in the same journal on the bacterial flagellum, the outboard motor. What he did was he said, as an engineer, how would I go about designing a propulsion system in a bacteria? He thought about the subsystems, the interrelationships, the constraints. And what he did then is, with the help of biologists, look at the details of the actual motors in cells. And what he was able to do is he found that he anticipated many, many features of this system. Because if you want to have a propulsion system, there's very, very few ways you can make that happen. He was able to use engineering knowledge to figure out why all the different subsystems interacted and operated in that particular way. He was able to figure out a lot of the constraints. And of course, a recently published book called Your Design Body by system engineer Steve Lofman and medical practitioner Howard Glicksman showed how the systems level engineering approach helps us to understand systems in the human body in a much deeper and more profound level. So for instance, one of my favorite examples is they looked at hearing. And what you find in hearing is you have multiple subsystems working together to achieve the goal of hearing. And I'll just mention one feature. So one of the big, cha one of the big challenges is what's called impedance matching because sound in the air 
travels with a certain impedance. And that's just sort of the resistance that sound has moving through air. But what happens in your ear is you have this organ called the cochlea. And what it has inside of it is a membrane. And it's really quite brilliant because this membrane, different parts of the membrane vibrate at different frequencies. So it essentially will deconstruct sound into the different frequencies. And then specific hair cells are triggered for each separate frequency, which send parallel signals to the brain, which again reconstructs it. Well, the challenge is the cochlea is filled with liquid. So the impedance in a liquid is different for the impedance in air. So if the sound from the air directly interacted with the cochlea, very little of the sound would penetrate because most of the energy would bounce back because of the different impedances. But the ears solve that by a brilliant design. They have these three bones called ossicles, and they create a double hinge structure. And you have these three bones of the perfect shape, the perfect size, they're perfectly mounted in the surrounding tissue, and the, the relative lever arms are just perfect, and the areas in which they touch the tympanic membrane, in which they touch the cochlea, are perfectly designed so that the impedances are matched. So nearly all the energy of the sound goes into the cochlea and then is transmitted into neural signals. Now, again, let me just mention one other feature, which is risk management. The challenge is these bones are much, much smaller than what you would find in their supposed ancestor, which are these mammal-like reptiles called therapsids. So these little bones resonate with different frequencies than their supposed ancestors did. Mammals hear a different frequency range than non-mammals, like the therapsids, the mammal-like reptiles. So what happens is the basal membrane was re-engineered to resonate with the right frequencies to match hearing that takes place in the air and the natural frequencies of these bones. This genius design allows you to distinguish very, very faint noises and to distinguish slight differences in frequency, but it's also very vulnerable to damage. So what happens is the, the bones have special muscles attached to them, which are triggered when you hear loud noises. So there's a neural feedback loop that goes through these muscles. So they stop the bones from moving as much in loud sounds, and that protects your ear from damage. So again, this very systems level analysis of hearing gives incredibly deep insights into how the entire system is designed for that purpose of hearing. Okay, well, I asked for examples of how an engineering framework brings us a better understanding of living systems, and we got examples. So for those of you who are interested in learning more about how engineering helps us to better understand biology, there's a couple sources we can point you to. We can point you to Brian Miller's chapter in the book, Science and Faith and Dialogue, which you can find on our Discovery Institute website. Another great resource is the book, Your Designed Body by Steve Laufman and Howard Glicksman, which is a fantastic foray into understanding the human body through an engineering mindset. So Dr. Brian Miller, thank you so much for talking to us today about biomimetics and how engineering helps us to understand biology. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. I'm Casey Luskin with ID The Future. Thanks for listening. Visit us at idthefuture.com and intelligentdesign.org. This program is Copyright Discovery Institute and recorded by its Center for Science and Culture.